For today's algorithm, we are going to be discussing splay trees. So before we can talk about the splay tree, we first need to understand the concept of a self-balancing binary search tree. Now, a self-balancing binary search tree is a binary search tree that automatically keeps its height small in the face of arbitrary item insertions or deletions. A splay tree is a member of this subset of trees of the self-balancing binary search trees. A splay tree is a self-balancing binary search tree with the additional property that recently accessed elements are quick to access again. Now, the splay tree maintains this property by using tree rotations on any of its operations. Now, a tree rotation is an operation on a binary tree that changes the structure of the tree without interfering with any of the order of the elements. So there are two types of rotations to talk about. The first one is the right rotation, and the second is the left rotation. The right rotation brings the current root's left child to the root of the tree. And a left rotation brings the current root's right child to the root of the tree. So now that we have these two rotations, let's give an example of what it would look like on a real tree. So on the left here, you'll see a tree rooted at 50. We're going to rotate 20 to the root. Therefore, we're going to do a right rotation of 50. So to do this rotation, what we need to do is first break off the left child of 50, which gives us a subtree rooted at 20. Then we need to break off the right child of 20, which gives us a subtree rooted at 30. Now we are going to restructure this tree. We're going to rearrange the tree such that 20 is at the root and 20's right child is 50, with 50 maintaining the same right subtree. But now the left subtree of 50 is going to be the subtree rooted at 30 that we broke off earlier. And of course, 20's left child is going to maintain the same element, which is 10. So this is an example of a right rotation. Now that we've given an example of a right rotation, let's take a look at the actual algorithms. So the right rotation algorithm works exactly as we did in the example. First, we're going to break off the left subtree of our current root. We're gonna call this the new root. We're then gonna set the left child of the old root to be the new root's right child. And we're going to make the new root the root by setting its right child to be the old root. Similarly, for the left rotation, this time we're just going to break off the right child of our old root and make that the new root. And we're going to take the old root's right and set that to the new root's left. And then lastly, we make the new root the root of the tree by setting its left to be the old root. So now that we've discussed algorithms for rotations, both left and right, we can now talk about splaying. So well, splaying basically brings the recently accessed node to the root of the tree. This, of course, naturally brings all nodes close to the recently accessed node, close to the root of the tree as well. This is how the splay tree maintains its guarantee that recently accessed elements are quick to access again. So in order to discuss how the splaying algorithm works, we generally break this down into three cases. So let's first take a look at case one. Now, case one is the case where the root is the parent of the node we want to display. We call this the zig case. Now, in order to finish the zig case, we either have to do a left rotation of the root or a right rotation of the root. So as an example, let's splay 20 to the root of the tree. We've already seen this. And we know that the resulting tree is found by just doing a single right rotation of 50 
leading us to have 20 at the root of the tree, 50 as the right child of 20 with the same right subtree, 50's left subtree containing node 30 and its right child 35, and 20's left child being 10. The next case we talk about is the case when the root is the grandparent of the node we want to display. And we can reach the grandchild of the root by taking two of the same paths down the tree. That is, we either are going to move left and then left, or we are going to move right and then right. We call this the zig-zig case. So for example, we may want to display the node 10 to the root of the tree. To do this, we are going to have to do two right rotations. We're first going to right rotate 50, and then we're going to right rotate 20. So when we right rotate 50, we end up with the same tree that we have above. 20 as the root, 10 as its left child, 50 as its right child, 30 as 50's left child with the same child, 35, and 50's right subtree being the same as before. Next, we have to right rotate 20. This is gonna leave us with 10 at the root, 20 as 10's right child, 50 as 20's right child, and 50's subtrees the same as before. Now that we've talked about these two cases, this brings us to the third and final case. This is the case when the root is the grandparent of the node that we want to display, but it can only be reached by taking two different direction paths. For example, we either would go left, right to reach the root we want to display, or we will go right, left to reach the root that we want to display. In the example on the left, let's display 30 to the root. 30 is reached from the root by going left and then right. Therefore, in order to display it to the root, we're going to have to first make a left rotation of 20 and then a right rotation at 50. So let's do that. Let's take the left rotation of 20 first. The left rotation of 20 leaves us with a subtree rooted at 30, the left child 20, a right child 35, and 20's left child being the same 10. Next, we want to right rotate 50. So to right rotate 50, this brings 30 to the root, 50 as its right child, 35 as 50's left child, 50's right child being the same subtree, and 30's left child being the subtree rooted at 20. Now, as I said, there are three cases, and we discussed all three, but in reality, you cannot guarantee that splaying a node will be a node that is two levels below the root. So in most cases, in order to splay to the root, you have to actually combine a sequence of these operations, either zigzags, zigzigs, zigs, or a combination of all three. So let's look at an example that actually uses a combination of zigzag and zig and zigzig. So uh, one such node would be if we wanted to splay 35 to the root. Now to splay 35 to the root, working from the bottom up, we notice that to splay 35 to its grandparents root 20, we have to take a zig zig, which would mean we have to do a left rotation followed by a left rotation. After we have 35 as the root of that subtree, in order to get it to the root of the full tree, we have to do just a zig operation, which entails a right rotation of 50. So let's first do our zig zig. So first have to left rotate the grandparent of 35. Left rotating the grandparent of 35 leaves 30 at the root, 20 as its left child with the same subtree, and 35 as its right child. Now to bring 35 to the root of this subtree, we have to again left rotate. This will bring 35 to the root, 30 as its left child, and containing the same left subtree as before. 
Now that 35 is the root of the left subtree of 50, we now just need to do the zig operation. The zig operation can be completed with a single right rotation at the root. So right rotating 50 gives us 35 at the root, 50, and it's entailing right subtree as its right child, and 30, and it's entailing left subtree as its left child. So those are the three cases, followed by a more realistic application of the splay tree. Now that we've discussed pretty much everything there is to know about splaying, let's talk about the runtime of this operation. Now, when we talk about the runtime or the cost of splaying, we really discuss amortized costs as opposed to worst case costs. Now, what is amortized cost? Well, amortized cost is the worst case average time of a particular operation. So when we're discussing the runtime of splaying, we need to know first the amortized cost of any single splay operation. The amortized cost of a single splay operation is bounded by O of log n, where n is the number of nodes in the tree. Now, if we consider a sequence of m operations on a splay tree, we notice that that sequence of m operations, the cost of that is bounded by O of m times log n, m being the number of operations and n being the number of nodes in the tree. So now that we've discussed splay trees, what is the point of splay trees? What is the benefit of using it? Well, a splay tree, as you could probably tell, maintains good locality properties. That is, recently accessed items are near the root of the tree at all times. Therefore, if you want to access groups of items that are similar to one another and belong in the similar parts of the tree, a splay tree allows you to access those elements very fast. Therefore, it's only natural that you would use a splay tree in MRU applications. MRU stands for most recently used. That is applications that want to reaccess most recently used elements and elements similar to the most recently used elements. Such things in real life may include garbage collection algorithms or caching for websites. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial on splay trees and I hope you learned everything that you wanted to know. If you want to make a suggestion for what video you want covered next, you can leave that in the comment section down below. Otherwise, please leave a like, subscribe, comment, and click on the top right over here if you want to see the video on binary search trees, and on the top left over here if you want to see on binary search tree operations. Thanks again for stopping by and I'll see you guys in the next video. Stay tuned.